Um, but thank you all for joining. Uh, welcome. The title of my talk today is Digital Health and Opportunities for AI-Enabled Nephrology. So a quick introduction. Yes, I am in this division. I'm one of the AI uh, people that kind of sit towards the back of the room in the, in the faculty meetings and everything. Uh, but I am an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Medicine in our division, of course. Um, I got my PhD in computer science in 2020, uh, also from UF. Um, I'm also currently the assistant director of clinical AI in IC3, uh, which is the center that Dr. Bjorek and Dr. Rashidi um, from Biomedical Engineering co-direct. Um, I would describe myself as sort of a biomedical data scientist or clinical AI researcher, sort of like a multidisciplinary um, experience. And what I do can broadly be classified as developing AI uh, tools for potentially augmenting uh, clinical decision making in practice. And so while it might not be the best analogy, I kind of uh, consider what I do, you know, I'm striving towards building tools that doctors can use um, as comfortably as they use other tools that they might not fully sort of understand uh, the inner workings of, for example, and I'm taking a wild guess. Maybe you all do understand the physics and the magnetic fields and things that I certainly don't understand, but um, I think yeah, the important part about using a tool such as an MRI machine, I mean, knowing when to use it, when not to use it, when to order it, when to, you know, how to interpret the results. And I think those similar, um, or those ideas can also be applied to some of the AI tools that are being developed. Um, so this is the roadmap, uh, the, the set of topics for today. So, you know, I've been here for a couple of years now and I've, I've gone to a lot of these Serena Grand Rounds meetings, including the other AI faculty, Dr. Shao, Dr. Sarder, um, and, and I also work with many clinicians who uh, never were exposed to AI at any point. And I, I do some educational workshops and activities for um, teaching AI to novices. I really think that some of the uh, material that Dr. Sarder and Dr. Shao have presented could be a little high, high level, right? So I thought this was a good opportunity um, to take a step back and maybe talk about uh, the basics of clinical AI. You know, basically, why should you care? What, what does it really mean? Um, so make it a little more concrete and not so abstract, you know, where we're doing AI. Um, so a big chunk of this talk is focused on uh, what AI means to you all as clinicians, as neurologists who are practicing. And so we're going to talk about uh, the progress in real world employment, uh, some of the challenges, some of the opportunities, uh, future directions, uh, just for, you know, clinical practice in general. And then uh, from there, we'll sort of move into nephrology specifically. And I'll be talking about uh, some of the previous uh, applications of AI and nephrology, which, spoiler alert, have been mostly sort of retrospective, you know, in silico research that haven't really made, um, got to the bedside yet, um, but we're getting there. Um, then I'm going to talk about specifically uh, four studies from 2023 uh, that I thought were really great, um, which can sort of uh, be a preview towards where, where we're headed, right? Uh, and then I'm going to connect those four studies to current research that's being done in our division here at UF. Uh, I'll conclude the talk briefly with my own research. And sometimes these talks can be sort of like a research dump of people who do a lot of research. I'm trying to sort of do something a little different and, and provide like an educational sort of overview of AI. Uh, but I will get into some of my own research, which is largely um, in critical care settings, more general than just foreign nephrology applications. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll finally end with um, an opportunity if any of this sounds exciting to you or you'd like to learn more, uh, we're developing this sort of uh, unique training program here at UF called AI Passport uh, that could be useful for you all to gain some additional knowledge and experience with AI. Um, okay, so with that said, AI um, in term, you know, AI in medicine uh, can be contextualized in this sort of environment called digital health, right? So this is um, a priority area for the FDA. Uh, they sort of named it uh, digital health. We have this definition coming from the FDA. Uh, they define digital health as a strategy to advance development quality of health care delivery and improve outcomes using digital solutions. So not always a fan of definitions that kind of include both, <laughs> but include both words in the actual definition. But I think we can all sort of like understand what that's getting at, right? It's, it's basically the use of technology uh, to change or improve uh, the delivery of, of health care. Um, digital health technologies could enable, you know, generating data, um, analyzing data from individuals, from, from practitioners, from entire healthcare systems, 
um, across populations and connecting patients to caregivers, um, to other uh, staff and things like that across the entire care continuum. So it's really about um, information, I would say. Oops. Um, right, and using information to you know, empower patients, uh, give providers more control, more granular um, information about their own patients to, to inform better uh, decision-making in practice. Um, I was fortunate enough to attend uh, this ADKEY meeting in 2022, where the goal was to sort of discuss and form consensus on how we can um, apply the FDA's concepts of digital health, uh, specifically to AKI. And so some of these figures are from that um, paper that was published, that consensus statement uh, that was published last year. And so we can see that uh, digital health, I mean, there, there's so many different opportunities to apply some of these um, tools and models and, and software and things like that, you know, in acute care settings and post-acute care settings and a community setting, uh, you know, for AKI in particular, you know, risk stratification, recognition, response, you know, all the, all the R's there, recovery. Um, and in terms of tools, uh, like I said before, AI is, is just a piece of the entire digital health sort of puzzle. Um, and I, I circled kind of the, the areas that I'll be talking about mostly today and for my own research lines is using AI, which would include machine learning, deep learning, et cetera, in a hospital setting. Um, but aside from that, we have other tools, you know, such as remote health and health monitoring, video conferencing, of course, you have information technology systems that facilitate the transfer of information um, that you all use every day. Um, lots of different concepts and tools and things like that. Uh, but these are the two areas that I will be focusing on today. Uh, yeah, so here we have a quote from the FDA. Um, they actually created a, an entire center uh, within the FDA to study these digital health um, you know, technologies, solutions, etc. And they really feel strongly about it, and, and so do I. Okay, so let's jump into what AI is. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time actually teaching um, AI and machine learning. I mean, that can be <laughs> that can be several talks. Uh, I'm going to sort of describe it and try to put it into context, right? So if you ask if you ask me what is AI or what is machine learning, I mean, there's so many definitions out there uh, that seem to be sort of changing <laughs> continuously. Uh, so I put a couple there. I'm sure you can't read that uh, from, from there, actually. But um, the top left one there is from the FDA. Um, all the definitions from different sources seem to follow a, a similar trend where AI is sort of this broader... Um, outer umbrella topic um, that is sort of like mimicking real intelligence, you know, if it's artificial intelligence, mimicking human uh, behavior uh, with uh, machines and things like that. And machine learning is typically defined as using data, right? Now you're getting into the nitty gritty using algorithms to learn patterns from data, pattern mining, and things like that. Um, and then with the machine learning, you have different types of machine learning. Uh, some of this might be familiar, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but you have supervised learning, and that's where you provide examples uh, of something. You know, it could be um, a patient's EHR and then the outcome, whether they died or not, uh, seven days post discharge or whatever it is. Um, give the machine, oops, give the machine enough of those examples, and it might learn um, to recognize who might be at higher risk. For example, that, that's one example. So that would be supervised learning, where you're providing the input and the label, so and the outcome, right? Uh, to the model. Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, uh, you're not providing any sort of supervision. You're not um, providing the answers to the machine. You're letting it sort of figure out things on its own just from input data. So you could provide um, an unsupervised learning algorithm with thousands of patient records, and it sort of learns to categorize them um, based on what it thinks, you know, what it thinks are important. So it's sort of like groups them. You can picture clustering. You're familiar with that. Um, that's a type of unsupervised learning. Um, and then finally, reinforcement learning is sort of the lesser explored or lesser um, you know, lesser published area of machine learning. You see it a lot with like game playing and things like that, but that's about training sort of a, an autonomous agent to take actions in the real world. So I think we might see more of that in the future, uh, but thus far, I would say supervised learning has dominated um, the machine learning landscape. And if you read machine learning articles, especially I would say in medicine and nephrology, most of what you see is gonna be considered uh, supervised learning. And that's why I have that giant black arrow there. So I'm going to go now to, so you know, I, 
I've met I've met with several clinicians in the past couple of years to start new um, collaborations. They usually come to me and other AI faculty with a great idea, um, or they're just super excited about applying AI. They see AI plastered all over the university and, and get all the emails and things, and they get they get excited, uh, but they don't know exactly what it means. You know, some people some people think it's magic, can do anything. Some people don't care. Some people want to learn more. Um, but what I found through these different collaborations is that um, a lot of times um, people are familiar with statistics, right? A lot of people are familiar with statistics. You kind of have to be to interpret uh, clinical trials and things like that, and, and be, at least be comfortable, have a working knowledge of statistics. And the thing is, statistics is very similar to machine learning or AI. Um, in that you're you're looking at data and you're building a model um, to you know to maybe predict something or discover important factors, risk factors or something like that, the magnitude of risk factors, for example. And so I like this figure from a, a New England Journal of Medicine article last year that sort of compared um, traditional statistics to machine learning. And you can see that uh, while similar, right? You're doing sort of the same thing at the end. Uh, there are some important differences between them, and I thought I would just highlight some of those uh, from my own personal experience and, and from this great uh, review article, too. Um, you know, first of all, when you're building a model with statistics, you, as experts, like drawing on your, you know, vast domain knowledge and experience can sort of identify which risk factors might be important for a specific outcome, right? So it's very structured. You select different variables. You know, I think age will be important. I think height or weight will be important. Um, and, you know, we, we can have this hypothetical example of predicting diabetes, right? Well, have that in your mind while you're, while you're hearing this. Uh, you're picking certain risk factors. You're building this statistical model. Uh, it's very structured. And at the end, you sort of look at maybe the coefficients of the variables to determine, you know, which ones are more influential or put the patient at higher risk. Um, so kind of a, a perk of that is that it's very explainable. It's very... Uh, transparent what's going on. Uh, it's been done for hundreds, thousands of years. Um, one of the downsides is that it's very, it's difficult to scale that to large data sets. Uh, but I think even more difficult is that it's hard to integrate multimodal data. And I think that's going to come up uh, several times throughout this talk. And that's an area that I'm personally interested in, is this multimodal data. So you have this continuous data, for example, from EHR, you have lab test results, you have vital signs and things like that that can go into a model, uh, but you might have medical images that you want to feed into. Um, and maybe you don't want to bias it by extracting certain features from an X-ray or an MRI. You just want to pass in the whole thing and let the machine figure it out, for example. Uh, you might have waveforms from an ECG or something like that. You, you could have um, free text that's that's getting big now, with things like chat technically. Uh, you have clinical notes that are being used. So that's what I mean by multimodal data, different modalities of data. Um, you know, a linear regression model can't really handle that at all. And that's sort of one of the main advantages of AI, of modern AI, um, deep learning in particular, is its ability to handle multimodal data. Um, okay, so let's jump down to AI now. Um, what AI is good at, and, and I think what they mean here by AI, AI is deep learning. So you might've heard that term as well, artificial neural networks, deep learning. That's sort of like the most popular form of AI these days. But how that works is that you sort of just feed in a bunch of data, that, all the data that you have, and let the model figure out sort of the connections between data, uh, how different variables interact, um, let the model learn on its own how to differentiate, um, for example, diabetic patients from not diabetic patients, um, or whatever the outcome happens to be. Um, it sort of iteratively learns how to do that automatically without requiring sort of any uh, domain knowledge or experience. So it's, um, you know, it, it does it all on its own. Um, as such, it's very difficult to interpret the end result. And I think that is sort of the sticking point. That's the point that needs to be emphasized here. It's a whole area of research in AI. It's, it's a massive uh, field of explainable AI because without that, um, these algorithms are typically black boxes. Right, so I work with, with a couple of collaborators who want to know um, what factors are important for a certain prediction. Well, that's can't really do that with, with AI. 
I mean, there are methods to, to do that um, after the fact, but it's there's no consensus, right? Um, people are still researching that. Um, it's it's kind of a uh, it's that definitely an ongoing area of research, right? So the question becomes, I guess, like whether you want like how important that is for a given application, right? You have some algorithm that can predict who's going to die with you know 100 percent accuracy, but you have no idea how it's generating those predictions. Do you still use it? I mean. Kind of have to weigh the risks and benefits, right? Uh, but that is one of the, the main drawbacks of AI is its lack of interpretability, and that's that's shown there as well. So this is a kind of a nice article from a little while ago, actually, uh, two thousand one, and they kind of outlined that there are two main goals in any statistical data analysis, and I would argue that this applies to both traditional statistics and AI. Uh, you want to be able to make a prediction, and you want to extract some information. Um, about the system that you're modeling, right? And so you have two like cultures, I suppose. Uh, the data modeling culture um, looks at sort of this natural phenomenon and develops a model to explain that phenomenon with certain inputs. And I think that's typically what you all are more familiar with um, from reading studies and things like that. Uh, you can see in the box maybe that you use models like linear regression, um, Cox regression, um, you know, th things like that to sort of model the actual process that uh, kind of converts what the input is into the output. Whereas the algorith algorithmic modeling culture doesn't really care about that. It sort of bypasses that altogether and trains uh, what I might refer to as a black box um, to go from input to output. You don't really care about what's actually causing or driving the outputs from inputs. Uh, you're simply modeling the relationship. Um, so that's kind of a big, difference um, that I think is important to know, especially for anyone new to AI, uh, such as yourselves, that maybe making assumptions. But um, you know, that, that's super important to, to understand. Uh, this is, I, I thought this was just kind of a fun slide. I don't want to spend too much time here, but if anyone has heard about deep neural networks and things like that, artificial intelligence, it sounds very mysterious and complicated. Uh, it's really not. And the math is really not that uh, complex. You know, I would say the old school AI, the math is much harder than these deep neural networks that sound fancier, but they're not really. Um, I thought this was a great slide, actually. If you're familiar with linear regression, you can you can uh, portray that, you can visualize that as this upper left box here, uh, where you have some input variables and you know the, the, the regression learns these coefficients uh, for each variable and a bias term and um, models the output y or f of x here uh, using those, right? Um, it, and that's for sort of modeling a continuous uh, target or out, outcome. If you transform that, or you can transform that into a classification, right, into a binary uh, decision simply by adding something like a sigmoid activation on top of that, uh, that's the lower box there. Uh, you might call that logistic regression, for example. Uh, these are generalized linear models. And, and so all a neural network is doing, essentially, is treating the output of one of these logistic regressions um, there as, as, as an input to the next layer, right? So you're doing, you're, you're stacking all these logistic regressions um, into, into layers uh, that, that are wide and deep. And anyways, I don't wanna linger on this too much, but uh, if you're interested, you should look into this more because uh, this sort of clicked for me a while back when I, when I looked at this, uh, I thought it was really great uh, way to, to visualize the the jump from traditional stats or regression into uh, deep neural networks. Okay, so I wanted to take a second to sort of explain um, what a typical clinical AI research pattern is, or more accurately, what a paper might look like. You start reading papers like this. I've noticed that the, the flow is a little different. Um, the objectives are a little different from other types of research. Uh, so I wanted to spend a, a few minutes talking about this. Um, of course, most clinical AI research is performed on computers and it's not implemented in practice, unfortunately. I think we're moving there, and I do have a slide on, on the uptake there. Um, but, uh, but when you see this, this you know, wonderful, um, highly praised AI medicine study, odds are it's, it's simply it's using retrospective data. So it's all about potential, I would say, these days. Um, right, and results, you know, the data sets are typically retrospective in nature. Um, observational cohorts, things like that. We are getting into some more clinical trials. I think the very next slide talks about that. 
But um, but in terms of the flow of how you would start and finish a typical research uh, project and how the paper might look at the end, uh, you acquire data. You know, you, you have a question, I guess, uh, you're, or something you're trying to predict. Then you acquire the data. Um, the important point here, one of the important points, is that you hold out, you reserve a set of that data um, to evaluate how good your model is doing. Right. So I noticed that, like when studies uh, build a regression model, um, like I was talking about before, they use the entire data set. Um, you don't have to hold anything out to to see how well the model actually predicts. You're sort of assuming that part. Um, right, so, so you do that, uh, you develop a prediction model on the training data, you evaluate the predicted performance of that model on your holdout data that you might call the test data, test set. Um, and then, you know, the paper would discuss how this could be used in practice. But, um, but yeah, so that's typically how most of the clinical AI research papers um, look. What's less common uh, in those types of studies is external validation, perspective validation, implementation, uh, but we are moving in that direction. Um, also less common is explainability, like I was saying before, transparency, interpretability. We're also getting better in that area. Uh, calibration, making sure the probabilities that are output from the model kind of like reflect um, what's actually happening in the real world so you can sort of interpret that as a, as a, as a good probability. Um, and then what's rare, but we are making progress in all three of these areas are, you know, analyzing the bias and fairness, right? I think we've, I mean, at least I've been hearing about this a lot lately. Um, one of the drawbacks of machine, lear of machine learning and AI, I think it was shown somewhere in that table uh, a few slides ago, is that um, they can uh, tend to be biased based on the input data. I mean, that's a whole can of worms that we can get into about, you know, bias data leads to bias models and things like that. So that's a whole area of research as well. But uh, actually analyzing the models for how biased they are, how fair they are to different uh, protected demographic groups, um, you know, using methods to uh, minimize or mitigate the bias. Um, that, that's, that's an ongoing area of research that's sort of rare to see. Um, I would say a little less rare these days. Um, ident identifying the failure modes, um, super important, I think, for eventual implementation of AI would be, you know, sometimes you just have weird things that happen when uh, the model sees a certain type of pattern, um, it might just fail or explode or give you like a wrong prediction, but consistently wrong. And I would call that like a failure mode. Um, you don't really see uh, too much of an exploration of that. And then clinical trials are rare, uh, but they are becoming less rare. So this was a study last year uh, that's still under review somewhere. It, it's a preprint. Um, they looked at all the clinical trials of AI in the you know in the real world, right? So they found eighty four, uh, eighty four RCTs actually, which seemed like a lot to me. Uh, this figure down here kind of shows where they're happening. So a lot of them are in China. Uh, Twenty nine percent of them are in China. Uh, Thirty one percent of them are here in the states. And you have some scattered around. But, um, you know, the results look pretty good, at least from the summary uh, table here. Um, 64 of the 84 kind of showed significant improvement over the baseline comparator. Um, uh, right, right. So and you can look at the different types of comparisons that were done, AI versus clinician, AI versus routine care, assisted versus unassisted, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so these kind of paint a rosy picture, and I haven't personally explored um, what these are are doing, but the results seem uh, very promising, um, at least uh, these preliminary results. And for some reason, I think it's China that, that weighs it so heavily that the gastroenterology is sort of the uh, specialty that has seen the most uh, clinical trials, all about radiology, which I would expect. Uh, okay, so why should you care about AI? Well, you know, it's not directly applicable because this was a survey of uh, 3,000 executives, you know, working in the industry. So it's not, you know, not the same demographic, um, but uh, everyone thinks that a huge chunk of the workforce is going to have to reskill in AI. I think that's pretty clear to most people, uh, but but the number 40% uh, is just, that, that's that's huge. That's obviously it's billions of people, um, you know. Um, so I think the same can apply here. That we talked about in a, a slide after this, but uh, I thought this is very interesting from this uh, published article last year. 
that show the importance of STEM skills, at least to people who are making hiring decisions, is actually decreasing, uh, which seemed a little uh, counterintuitive to me. But I think there are a couple of reasons that explain that. One is that they've sort of been viewed as table stakes, where they just assume everybody is more familiar with some of this more science, um, scientific aspects um, of the, the tools and things like that. But I think more importantly is that technology has matured uh, to the point where you don't really have to understand some of the very low level um, elements of some of these things, AI included. And this goes for any technology. But uh, this goes back to my very first slide about the MRI machine, you know, for example. So yeah, I, I'm not trying to personally teach doctors how to code up an algorithm from scratch. I think that's not a good use of the most time. Um, but can we make tools that are easy to use where you don't have to understand the coding as long as you understand kind of the major concepts for applying their practice? Uh, a couple of just a couple of quotes about how you know AI is going to transform medicine. You've probably seen other quotes to this nature and studies and, and articles and things like that. Uh, we had one from the Harvard Medical School that talks about the AMA and we have this. I mean, I've seen this, I've seen an iteration of this quote, you know, countless times. But um, I think it's true. You know, I think physicians who use AI are going to replace those who don't. Uh, you're not going to replace yourself. So um, that's just my my humble opinion. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's talk about what this can do. You know, what, what can AI do in clinical practice, right? So I'm going to start on the right side here, which uh, kind of shows the, the future, potential future of the next generation of evidence-based medicine, where they sort of argued that what we have so far, you know, background information, expert opinion, case control studies, cohort studies, RCTs, uh, crit uh, critically appraised topics, systematic reviews, all of that, um, that leads to guidelines and, and things like that. That's simply the you know scratching the surface or the tip of the iceberg of what's possible uh, with AI, deep learning, factoring all of these different. Uh, you probably can't see it, but it, it lists all these different types of data, right? Lab data, research data, nutrition data, omics data, um, telehealth data. I mean, there's all, all different types of data, and then the algorithms to capitalize on that type of data can really um, result in this you know next generation of evidence-based medicine. On the left, this is a good figure that sort of outlines the progress. You know, it was published a couple of years ago, but outlines the progress um, of clinical AI, the challenges, the opportunities. Uh, some of the opportunities are where um, I'm currently working that we'll, we'll talk about at the end. But I did want to focus on the deployment progress uh, so far, because that might be most relevant for a practicing clinician. And so we're going to talk about um, Two things that are highlighted there, FDA approvals and CMS reimbursement, in particular the, the coding, you know, CPT codes of, of these AI, AI, um, AI procedures, you know, algorithms and devices that use AI to, to, to operate. Um, okay, so if you weren't aware, the FDA views AI as, you know, they consider it software as a medical device. So they view, they view AI algorithms as a medical device, essentially. And they, divide, they define four categories of software as a medical device based on the level of impact on the patient. Um, makes sense, right? So you have critical or serious or non-serious conditions of the patient. And then you have what the AI is actually doing, right? Is it just informing clinical management? Is it driving clinical management? Or is it actually treating or doing something serious like diagnosing that maybe doesn't even require a doctor's input? Um, different levels of... Uh, importance and, and, and criticality of AI in, in clinical practice. Um, so in terms of FDA authorization, we can see this sort of, it looks exponential to me, starting in about 2016-ish um, of the number of AI algorithms and, and tools that have been approved by the FDA uh, per year. So in 2022, they approved, it looks like about 140. Um, and I, I can only assume it goes up from there. Uh, so when you look at the specialties of these things, of course, radiology just dominates. That's like kind of the most mature domain, I would say, of clinical AI. Um, looking at the medical imaging, interpreting, you know, highlighting, all, all sorts of things um, are very, very well done uh, currently with radiology. Uh, if you're looking for nephrology, not on there currently. <laughs> um, maybe we'll change that one day. And you know, I haven't updated this part, but I looked uh, last October to see if any algorithms using LLMs, which would be like ChatGPT, have been authorized. Uh, there were none as of last October. 
Uh, but I'd be curious because I think that is definitely um, that, that you're going to be seeing that right in some form or another in practice very soon. Um, okay, so I wanted to move now into the CPT codes, right? Just for very briefly, and I know they're not. This isn't the end all be all, but it sort of sort of shows you how people are thinking about AI procedures and algorithms and things and how it might inform practice and the types of things that are possible with AI and how this could look in the future. So the AMA taxonomy, they describe every AI system as either assistive or augmentative or autonomous based on the level of um, um, autonomy, I guess. I think this table sort of summarizes it better here. Um, you have, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back. You know, assistive tools can detect things and then the physician takes over from there. Augmentative tools um, will detect things and then analyze and quantify it in some way and uh, still requires a physician's input. And then autonomous algorithms would sort of do everything. And I'm personally a little scared of, of that. <laughs> it sounds scary to me. Um, this is an algorithm doing, doing you know, everything without a physician's input potentially. But in terms of the autonomous algorithms, those are further subdivided into three levels based on you know, whether it's interpreting, recommending, acting, uh, et cetera. So I didn't wanna linger on this too much, but uh, I, I sort of listed the, the CPT codes for AI. I thought this was interesting. I don't know if anyone else cares about this sort of thing, or if you've seen these or heard of these, or maybe even use these, but uh, these are the CPT codes for the AI uh, procedures. So these, these are being used, right? These are actually being used in practice, being coded, um, you see some interesting things with the virtual reality, uh, facial recognition. Um, one of the big ones that have been around for a couple of years now is this uh, ophthalmos ophthalmoscopy thing. I don't, I don't know. I'm bad at pronouncing it. But um, yeah, so you have that. You have imaging, of course. You have you know new as of a few months ago. You have digital pathology where you when people are scanning, um, you know, generating whole slide images and things like that. So I thought this was just a good look of how AI is, is here. It's already here and it's already being coded. This isn't some far off thing. Um, it, 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 I think it would benefit everybody to sort of uh, become aware of AI. And again, I'd love to talk to people afterwards about whether you're even using it or, or have seen any of this, but uh, that's, a, that's a separate discussion. Um, okay, so let's talk about the real world adoption, right? So there was a study uh, last year that looked at, you know, this IQ VIA data set that included 16 billion CPT claims, 200 plus million patients, uh, lots of different claims. They looked for these AI uh, codes that, that were shown in the previous couple slides. So they found, you know, it, it hasn't really, it wasn't really being used on a large scale yet, right? Only four of them had more than a thousand total claims. Um, but then again, the median age of the codes is about one year old and they're continuously adding more. Um, and then I list here, like the most usage is this heart flow, just in case anyone is familiar with that, I'm certainly not, uh, or this Illuminatics core uh, to look at, um, you know, retinal images to diagnose diabetic retina. Uh, these are the codes they found in their analysis. Um, one of the figures, it's, it's hard to see, but it's not too important, just kind of shows the, the geographic distribution of where certain codes are used and sort of makes sense that, um, they're being used in high income areas and metropolitan areas, um, which you know, again kind of highlights the another aspect of the digital divide um, that uh, you know could be an issue going forward. Um, okay, so now I'm jumping into nephrology in particular. So we wrote this sort of this review article a couple of years ago uh, for Nature Reviews Nephrology, where we looked at all the different applications of AI in nephrology, and there have been more since. Um, but this was a good sort of very broad overview of, of how AI is being used for nephrology applications. And big asterisk here is that it's, oh no. <laughs> um, let's see. Big asterisk is that this is um, predominantly retrospective, maybe entirely retrospective. Uh, so no prospective validation, no uh, clinical trials at the time of writing this article. Um, it, it was all observational, you know, retrospective studies. Um, so it's really about the potential, right? 
So a lot of these studies, you know, looking at AKI or CKD or predicting kidney failure, ESRD, um, CKD, renal cell carcinoma, things like that, you know, kidney transplant, graft survival, lots of different applications where AI looks like it can really uh, benefit. And, and, and a lot of these are diagnostic um, tools, I would say, where um, it can very accurately sort of predict what's going to happen to the patient based on different factors uh, from their health. So this is just sort of painting just a broad picture of um, what's possible with AI in nephrology. Um, you know, I'd love to, if anyone's interested, you know, part, part of the reason of, of going through this is to, if anyone's interested, you know, in some area that you don't see here that you think AI could be used for, I'd love to talk, you know, let's, let's talk and <laughs> see what we can do. So now I wanna go through a few papers in a little bit more detail. Uh, just to sort of show you what this might look like um, and, and what it did look like for these studies. So this one was, and this one made waves in our community anyways. This was in 2019. It was a study done by DeepMind, which was uh, later bought, bought out by Google, where they predicted AKI every six hours, the patient was in the ICU. So every six hours, uh, this model would predict uh, the probability of future AKI, looking at different uh, time horizons, uh, looking at different uh, severity levels of AKI, um, all different combinations of that. Uh, but the point was sort of did it continuously or close to continuously. So every six hours, it would update its prediction of what it thought would be, what would happen to the patient in terms of uh, the patient developing AKI or their current AKI progressing to a more severe stage. Uh, they used this massive VA data set actually of uh, 700,000 patients um, over just a four-year period. Uh, one of the limitations that was sort of criticized by uh, some people was that the obviously the, the cohort was predominantly male. Uh, this data set was 94% male. Um, so the, the generalizability of the results were questioned a bit. Um, but let's go to the next slide, which shows the results. So, you know, over half of the few, again, this is future API, uh, the patient is, is healthy currently. Um, over half of the future API was predicted um, up to 48 hours ahead of time. And the figure in the lower left sort of shows as you get further and further away. So, you know, you know, predicting one hour from now, it's probably going to be pretty obvious if the patient will get AKI, so that's why the, the performance is higher. But as you get all the way out to 48 hours, um, you know, you start to pick up less of the future AKI. Uh, but you do get a decent amount, right, which is pretty impressive in my opinion. It detected 90% of all the AKI events that required dialysis. Um, and then they spent a lot of time talking about, you know, some of their uh, false positives were actually too early. Um, the AKI occurred, you know, outside that 48 hour prediction window. Um, so, uh, so yeah, there's that. And this is a, kind of a good point to bring up. So they sort of, you know, you can adjust, you know, I'm sure you kind of, kind of are aware that the, the sensitivity specificity can be Altered based on how many true positives, false positives you might get with the, with the alert system or something like that. Um, you'll get everybody if you just raise the flag for every single patient. If this patient's at risk, this patient's at risk for everybody. Um, you're going you're gonna to detect every case, uh, but it's going to be way too many false positives. So they selected one true positive for every two false positives as their sort of clinically uh, feasible ratio. Um, but the results change based on what the threshold is, and that would depend on like, who is using this hypothetical system and other factors like that. Uh, there was this follow-up study a couple of years ago um, that looked at that same paper that I just mentioned. Uh, they were specifically targeting the generalizability of that model because, again, it used the single, I mean, it wasn't a single center, but it was the VA data set um, with that big limitation of, of being very much uh, male focused data set. Uh, they looked at, at a subset of that data. <laughs> they looked at a subset of that data. Um, and then also at a data set from uh, University of Michigan to see if the model um, also uh, worked in their data set. So they found lower performance actually in the, the updated VA cohort. And, and also um, showed that it performed worse for females in the updated VA cohort and the University of Michigan. So this is another example of how biased data can lead to biased models. Uh, you don't 
you know, if you don't uh, pass in many females into a model, it's going to perform worse on females, and you know, that can be applied to um, race, ethnicity, or other other uh, demographics like that. That's a very important point to keep in mind. Uh, of course, we have a lot of AI and AKI research here through Dr. Bjork and, and collaborators. Um, she's big in that field, and I just wanted to mention that. I'm also involved in that. Um, a lot of it is uh, post-operative AKI. Uh, this study was very, I thought it was very cool. Um, so they, they looked at these whole slide images of kidney tissue and essentially used AI to extract um, histomorphologic features, so shape-based features from the whole slide images. Um, and they're listed here, tubules, glomerulus, glandular tuft, non-tissue background, artery, arterial lumen. And they associated those uh, identified structures with um, disease progression and things like that that's shown on the next slide. Um, but I thought this was very cool. So they essentially, you know, they show in terms of results, they show that uh, glomerular morphometry is associated with uh, specific diseases and kidney function loss. So they looked at, um, you know, uh, minimal change disease, lupus, uh, DN, HTN, other, other um, you know, kidney related uh, diseases and conditions, and saw, you know, significant differences between these different shapes in the whole slide images. So I think this is one of the big studies that um, kind of embody that notion of multimodality that I mentioned a while back. Um, you know, people have used whole slide images and digital pathology uh, for a few years now, but this was a big scale. I should have pointed that out. So 1,700 whole slide images across five cohorts is actually a big data set. So that's very nice. Um, you know, they showed that you can predict progression of disease uh, using different uh, different shape features um, between healthy cohorts and, you know, they can differentiate between healthy patients and patients who would eventually uh, develop these diseases or progression-free probability of, of um, IgA nephropathy, for example. Uh, very cool. So looking at the whole slide images in this study. Uh, of course, we have a big... Um, you know, a lot of that research going on here as well through Dr. Sarter. That's his thing. That's his bread and butter. I've worked with him on a couple of studies here. Uh, he looks at, at the same sorts of things, and it's very, very exciting time. Uh, now they're sort of starting to integrate uh, spatial uh, omics as well, um, molecular data with the um, with his, uh, histopathology. So it's very cool. Uh, this study was pretty amazing. To me, I'm not sure if you guys have seen these studies that can look at like pictures of the eye and determine uh, what's going on inside your body just by looking at your eye. So I thought that was very cool. Uh, they could predict um, systemic parameters from external eye photographs here. Um, and so some of them were kidney related, so that's why I'm bringing it up here. So they could pretty accurately estimate a patient's EGFR from looking at a picture of their eye which is very really cool. I mean, it has very huge implications for uh, the low resource settings and, and screening tools and things like that. But um, that's sort of the gist of this paper. And, you know, they, they showed their, their method worked well. Um, in terms of the kidney function abnormalities, uh, those were detected at more severe disease thresholds. So some other uh, systemic parameters and variables were detected a little higher accuracy than, than GFR um, and ACR but it still worked pretty well. Uh, older populations required a more severe decline in their GFR before the algorithm could detect it, which sort of makes sense if you're expecting older patients to, you know, for it to decline naturally. Um, but it's really very good at detecting uh, more subtle deteriorations of um, GFR in younger populations where I think it's more unexpected, right? Uh, okay, so this is the final sort of study that I'm reviewing uh, that was not from me overall collaborators, but this is also very cool. Um, uh, they detected, so they're looking at AVF uh, stenosis, right? so the, the, the AV fistulas um, for dialysis. And I think that's a, it, it's a big concern, right? So if, if you have a, if it's, if you have stenosis, I mean, if, you guys know this better than me, I'm sure, so I'm preaching to the choir, but if you have a stenosis, you need to um, kind of have this re-intervention, right? Or remodeling, or, or I'm not sure what the terminology is. Uh, but it's a very critical issue, right? 
Uh, so what they did was they used this digital stethoscope uh, and listened to the blood flow sounds going through the fistula. And that's all they needed to sort of determine whether it was uh, stenotic or not. I thought that was very cool, very not uh, non-invasive, obviously. Again, uh, big implications for screening tools, maybe even at home screening or in low resource uh, settings and, and countries, things like that. So they used AI and of course all of that. So what they did was they they listened to the sounds, they converted it, uh, you know, the Fourier transforms, I mean, you know, math and things like that, but it all was based on the sound. They predicted it well. Uh, the same authors, I believe, actually no, it was different authors, but they had nephrologists screen patients based on a physical exam and then you decide to predict whether the patient uh, babia was stenotic or not. Led to 0.96 sensitivity, 0.76 specificity, and then this model kind of showed very similar results, actually. Uh, so that was pretty cool. Um, they looked at different locations for sound readings and other things like that. Um, but I think the point is that this is, again, sort of like this unique data modality uh, with, with sounds, this is audio now, blood flow uh, audio. So I don't know, I thought that was very cool. Um, and then here at UF, I'm involved in this collaboration with uh, Dr. Berselli and, and his faculty and, and Dr. Shu in, uh, in Utah, where they are looking at this same thing, like predicting whether an AVF uh, is, will be stenotic or will require a re-intervention. So they kind of take an MRI, convert it to this uh, simulated blood flow uh, model. And then we're taking that, uh, feeding that into AI to sort of predict what's going to happen, you know, uh, six months down the road or three months down the road or two years, whether it's going to require some kind of uh, surgical re-intervention. So we are also doing that here at UL. Uh, okay, so I just want to briefly mention this article that came out um, I guess it was this month or maybe last month, yeah. Um, sort of reviewing the year uh, of AI and nephrology. And we pointed out the exact studies that I just mentioned here. Right? <laughs> so we talked about those four uh, major studies. And sort of the future, uh, in, in our view, this was me and uh, Dr. Bjorg, uh, where it's sort of these, it's the concept of a medical foundation model. So it's very similar to ChatGPT. ChatGPT is, is text only, it's language only, but um, the idea of a foundation model is that it can be multimodal as well. So you can feed in different types of data, images, um, patient EHR, um, activity data, waveforms, sounds, you know, wh whatever, whatever it is, um, and kind of like have the model learn how those data types relate to one another, um, injecting the linguistic capabilities of a large language model, just like ChatGPT, pretty good, right? Connect all of that together and you can unlock some pretty cool um, potential applications in the clinic um, where, you know, the doctor can sort of use this foundation model as a real-time assistant, asking questions, explaining things, um, you know, uh, we don't need to get into all the different applications because it's, you know, patient-facing as well. I mean, lots of applications there to empower the patient, to empower everybody. Basically, um, very, very cool. That's sort of the direction that the field is going broadly. And we're also sort of exploring that, you know, how we can integrate all the different types of data, this multimodal data together to form this uh, very deep data driven profile of a patient. Um, okay, so the final few slides here are just kind of summarizing the other work that I'm doing. Uh, most of it is. Like I said before, uh, not nephrology focused per se. Uh, sometimes we do include outcomes like AKI uh, in our predictions, but a lot of it is sort of this, you know, critical care setting. You know, predicting patient trajectories. So pretty general things that could be applied uh, in a nephrology setting. Uh, this one is predicting real time patient acuity scores. So how severe the patient's illness is in real time, uh, and sort of project whether they're getting better or worse, or if additional resources should be devoted to this patient, et cetera. Uh, worked pretty well. We had this mock-up of how it might look uh, in practice. Uh, and that's something that we're still exploring. We um, This was actually called deep SOFA because we only used the SOFA variables, which was like 14 variables, right? Used in the traditional SOFA score. We limited ourselves to those 14 uh, on purpose 
uh, just to be able to compare apples to apples, and we, we showed that ours was much better at using AI than the SOFA score at determining how sick the patient actually is and their chance, the probability of dying in the hospital. So, okay, so again, we have these uh, transformers, which is part of the foundation model thing that I was talking about a couple of slides ago. Uh, we're using those to sort of predict um, readmission risk, you know, ICU readmission, 30-day hosp hospital readmission, uh, mortality over different time windows, you know, in hospital, seven day, one month, uh, one year, et cetera. So we're, we're doing that, and this is all sort of starting to go towards that uh, that multimodal uh, foundation model that we uh, think is the future of uh, Fleming AI. Um, lots of post-operative um, complication prediction, right? And Dr. Bjork was pretty heavily involved in starting this years ago with my surgery risk. Uh, as kind of her flagship system, but we've sort of extended that a bit to uh, use deep learning to look at a patient's data before surgery and during surgery. And at the moment that surgery ends, we can update this prediction as to whether we believe the model thinks that the, the patient will develop uh, one of nine, one or more of nine post-operative complications. Um, what was cool with some of these works is that we included these mechanisms that are designed primarily for you all, for practicing clinicians such as the uncertainty estimation. So we, we not only predict like a probability of a patient developing, for example, uh, sepsis after surgery, we also um, kind of justify that by, it's impossible to see, but like showing which factors led to that prediction. Um, and if it all kind of like makes sense to you all, then, then you trust the decision more. So that, that's for, about uh, increasing trust in these models. Um, I'm sorry, that was the explainability aspect. So the uncertainty aspect is we also quantified how certain the prediction was as well. So that, that also, so both of those together uh, are meant to increase clinician trust in these models. Uh, this slide also talks about the same sort of thing, uh, different uh, techniques and methods for increasing the transparency, which I mentioned, you know, way early on, uh, that, which is one of the limitations of, of modern AI is that it's very opaque, it's a black box. So we're working on methods to open the black box or make it a little more transparent. Um, and then look, looking at things like uncertainty measures, other things like that to make it um, more trust, more trustable, more trusted by, by clinicians. Um, okay, so this is very, very recent. Uh, we're working with NVIDIA um, and one of their contractors, uh, Mark III, to develop this digital twin of the hospital. And so these are, these are actual pictures. This is not generated, <laughs> but but these are pictures. So we, we gave them pictures of, we chose an uh, ICU room in East Tower, gave them pictures, lots of pictures, and they turned that into um, this, uh, it's supposed to be a video playing, but it's okay. So they created this sort of digital um, replica of that ICU room, which um, we're planning on using for Lots of different applications. You can simulate a patient's uh, journey through the hospital, simulate their um, care that they're getting, simulate progressions of diseases and risks and things like that. And um, I don't know, it's, it's pretty pretty early days here, but um, that's what we're doing here. And so not sure if anyone has heard of this strategic funding from the UF president. He's very interested in AI. Uh, we received one of those awards to develop this digital twin. Um, uh, with NVIDIA. And yeah, so that video is not playing, but it's okay. You get, you get the gist. And finally, um, in another round of that strategic funding from the U.S. president, we received another award to develop this program uh, called AI Passport. So this is an educational program um, that has several kind of like unique elements that you don't see in typical training uh, programs. So this is what I mentioned at the very beginning about if any of this was interesting to you, if you'd like to learn more, uh, stay on the lookout or be on the lookout for this AI passport program that we're developing. So it's it's designed to teach AI to clinicians with, uh, low, we call it low math, no code. So you don't have to code, right? We're gonna use code to develop the tools so you don't have to use code. And from our experience, that's been a big um, roadblock for people mentally, maybe. Like they don't think they have time to code or learn coding. It seems like this monumental task. But uh, we're developing this whole program where you don't have to code at all. So it's code-free training uh, for you all, whoever wants to join. Um, lots of different aspects here, you know, videos, interactive 
uh, workbooks um, combining synchronous training uh, where you can connect with your peers and your expert mentors with uh, asynchronous self-paced stuff. Lots of cool things going on there. We have mentors who have signed on from um, all around the country and very excited about that. And uh, we're hoping to start the pilot testing of that um, coming this coming April. So if you're interested in that, please reach out to me and we'll add you uh, to our list. So I'm going to plug that really quick. And I think that is it. So thank you.